This is the second class about armed conflicts and human rights. In the previous class, we saw the laws of armed conflicts, known as international humanitarian law, the notion of war, the regulation of war, and the concept and the principles of international humanitarian law. As explained in that class, there are three main principles in international humanitarian law. Military necessity, proportionality or humanitarian principle, and the distinction principle. The principle of military necessity dictates that all those actions reasonably leading to obtaining a military advantage cannot be prohibited. The principle of proportionality or humanity, on the other hand, means that all those actions which, on the contrary, do not have a military necessity rationale are forbidden. The principle of distinction dictates that military necessity and proportionality must be wisely distinguished from each other. Now, from the three main principles just mentioned, stem five normative criteria. From them, in turn, thousands of specific rules are derived. The first criterion that stems from the three main principles is the concept of legitimate actors in an armed conflict. They are known as combatants. Combatants are those who have the right to participate directly in the hostilities, abiding by the rules of war. If captured, they have the privileged status of prisoner of war, which means they cannot be tried for having taken arms alone. On the other hand, civilians and non-combatants can never be targeted, yet they cannot take up arms without losing their quality as non-combatants. Members of the armed forces not taking part in the hostilities, such as religious and medical personnel, are also non-combatants. A second normative criterion is the category of legitimate target. In addition to the enemy combatants, they are the objects, places and assets that can be targeted due to their military value or their lack of direct impact on civilians. The third criterion refers to the means and methods of combat. Means are weapons, ammunition, and military material in general. Methods are combat strategies or tactics, that is, the mode of use or deployment of military material. The basic rule is that the means and methods that erase the distinction between combatants and non-combatants are prohibited. They include indiscriminate and perfidious means and methods of warfare. A weapon is indiscriminate per se if it cannot be directed at a military objective or if its effects cannot be limited to such objective. The use of a per se indiscriminate weapon is prohibited. The fabrication and stockpiling of some weapons, such as cluster bombs, are also prohibited. Concerning methods of warfare, they are indiscriminate if they cannot be directed to military objectives or cannot be limited to them. They are also indiscriminate if the collateral damage that may be anticipated is excessive in relation to the military advantage expected. Contemporary technological developments have led to what is termed precision warfare, while apparently providing means to avoid indiscriminate attack, precision warfare presents a host of novel legal and moral dilemmas. Perfidy is a technical term in humanitarian law. It means that a party to a conflict deliberately betrays the trust or good faith of the other party by making it believe that it is entitled to protection and then harming that deceived party. Typical examples of perfidy are the misuse of the white flag and of the red cross emblems. Camouflage, stratagems or ruses of war are not prohibited. The fourth normative criterion has to do with breaches of international humanitarian law. 
This body of law prescribes which breaches are considered to be grave. They amount to war crimes. For instance, premeditated murder and torture of protected persons are war crimes. A final criterion regards to the type of armed conflict regulated by humanitarian law, whether international or non-international. Rules are far more abundant and detailed for international than for non-international armed conflicts, although the bulk of armed conflicts today is of a non-international nature. Until the Second World War, humanitarian law regulated the following types of armed conflict. Conventional international war, conventional civil war, levy and mass or spontaneous uprising of the population against the invasion of enemy forces, and armed conflicts which fall short of an all-out war. After World War II, New kinds of warfare emerged, including massive air bombings, the possibility of nuclear warfare, new types of insurgency and counterinsurgency, and modern terrorism. The response of humanitarian law to the challenges presented by these new types of warfare has been insufficient and slow to come. Since the terrorist attacks against the United States on September 11, 2001, it is said that a new kind of conflict emerged, a novel form of international terrorism and its response, the so-called War on Terror. This issue will be dealt with in a future lesson dedicated to the topic of terrorism. As said before, jus ad bellum is the theory about the moral and legal reasons to justify the recourse to armed force, if any. Due to the traumas of World War I and World War II, the United Nations Charter established a strictly limited scope for the legal application of force internationally. This tendency is known as jus contrabellum. It only approves the use of force in self-defense and when authorized by the United Nations Security Council in order to secure or restore peace. However, after the Cold War, that is in the last 25 years or so, there has been a growing debate about humanitarian interventions in the face of humanitarian crises such as those occurred in Rwanda and Kosovo. Despite the lack of ostensible legal foundations for it, some say there may be a moral basis for humanitarian interventions, that is, the use of force internationally for humanitarian reasons. They put forward the following criteria for it to be justified just cause, legitimate authority, right intent, last resort and proportionality. On this basis, humanitarian intervention was debated in several cases during the 1990s. In subsequent years, a kind of humanitarian intervention 2.0 developed. It is known as the responsibility to protect. It may be said that the notion of a responsibility to protect is a nascent customary rule of international law. This responsibility to protect would befall on the whole international community. Since 2005, the notion of a responsibility to protect has gained international recognition at the United Nations General Assembly and through the United Nations Security Council resolutions, such as that authorizing the use of force against Libya in 2011. There are ethical and legal dilemmas regarding the use of remote controlled means of war with precise firepower, also known as drones. From a humanitarian law perspective, and regardless of their precision, these means of combat 
can violate the principle of distinction between civilians and combatants due to failures in the precision instruments. It may also amount to a violation of humanitarian law if the damage of the attack is excessive compared to the military advantage gained. But there is also an ethical dilemma in the notion of a robotic kind of warfare. This begs the question of whether it is right to decide on the life and death of other human beings from a remote location and without endangering ourselves, like gods. If war is a human activity, then the inclusion of non-human devices to do the fighting may change it altogether. Please visit our website mookchile.com and we kindly invite you to watch the next class of this course.